Welcome to this business of F1 video. F1 is changing its formula. The sport is poised to move to a new set of regulations in 2014 which bring in new technologies, more efficient engines and new look cars. But as we're enjoying one of the most entertaining and successful seasons in memory, is it necessary to change a winning formula? And can the teams afford it? As always with Formula One, this change is accompanied by a behind the scenes power struggle with money and control at the heart of it as the various factions negotiate a new Concord Agreement. One key question is, who should make the rules? The teams, the governing body or the commercial rights holder? And how does that sit with cost control? Here to discuss these topics with me are Graham Loudon, President and Sporting Director of Marussia F1 Team and Oliver Weingarten, General Secretary of F1 Teams Association. Graham, if I could start with you first. These 2014 engines are obviously going to be very, very expensive. Is it worth the cost of changing? Well. To be honest, I wish I knew. Um, the, I think whilst all the teams agree that it's, um, it's fantastic for Formula One to be innovative and, uh, and of course relevant, and that includes new and green technologies, what's unclear certainly to the teams at the moment is just how much the new engines would cost. And I think uh, in, the, in the current climate, sustainability um, of, the, of, the, of the business environment of Formula One is uh, is equally, if not more, important um, than uh, uh, than technology or uh, uh, or environmental impacts. In fact, you know we're really at that at that stage. So, if um, the introduction of the new engines doesn't impact the sustainability of the teams, then yes, of course, it's a, it's a fantastic thing. So, you know, the hope is that uh, we'll be able to get the best of both worlds, which is. Um, you know, some great exciting technology but not impact the sustainability of the teams. Well, what are we talking about at the moment? It's about five or six million or something for a supply of engines. Are we talking about three or four times as much for the new technologies? Well, this is, you know, this is really what I say and when I say I wish, I wish we knew, we have, there's no firm proposal from, uh, from any engine manufacturers. It's not clear who, um, which manufacturers are going to make um, the engines and we from a team's perspective, we need that clarity to plan. Oliver, obviously the resource restriction agreement was brought in with all the teams and the governing body and the commercial rights holder. Um, is there a danger now with a, the RRA sort of hanging in the balance, it hasn't been renewed between the teams, is there a danger of costs escalating in this void? Well firstly, the RRA was signed in um, 2009 and all the teams are parties to it and even the teams that have left the Formula One Teams Association are still parties to that agreement. And in Singapore, 2010, all the teams agreed to make some changes, but to extend it to 2017. So there's no issue in respect of the RRA lapsing. What we're actually discussing with the FIA is whether they might uh, incorporate it into the sporting regulations, which would then enable them to levy a sanction in the case of a potential breach, because that's obviously where uh, the teams have had some concern in the past as to what is the deterrent for potential breach. So the RRA is there, all the teams that are in the F1 um, environment at the moment are parties to it. The commercial rights holder is not a party to it. The FIA is not a party to it. It's in a, it was a voluntary agreement between the teams and it continues and it stays in force. But what about the, the rulemaking side of things, Graham? Because obviously that's up in the air as well. The, the, the current agreement ends at the end of this year. And as I understand it, there's a, there's a bit of a question mark about the rules for next year and who's actually going to make the rules. Is there, it's been the FIA in conjunction with the teams that have, have made the rules. And I, is that going to continue or could there be a different mechanism? The key elements is as I see it, is the you know the role of the FIA. Um, it's very important that the regulatory uh, function and the commercial function that there is a clear separation, and uh, and also the involvement of all the teams. Um, there's been discussions of subsets of teams, or um, or perhaps a, a smaller number of teams being represented, and I, I I cannot see how that can work if this is a if this is a truly global sport. If you were to only choose a small subsection of those teams to represent all the teams, that, that I, I just can't see how that could provide a level playing field um, for everyone to compete and, and, and move their businesses forward. And the process works very well actually. If you look at the FIA, it's got the sporting working group, it's got the technical working group. FOTA then has got the sporting regulations and technical regulations working group which mirror the agendas and it provides an environment for the teams to get together and we invite the non-FOTA teams to participate as well, but mm -hmm. to discuss all the issues so that when they go to the FIA's working groups, it can be a lot more constructive. And currently, all the teams are involved in that process, and the teams are satisfied with the way it works, and we are encouraging the FIA to continue with that approach. 
obviously Mauricio came into Formula One back in 2010, sort of two and a half seasons into it. It's a, you're up against some of the major manufacturers, very well established Formula One teams. What's it like operating a, a small team like yours and trying to build towards the front of the grid? You know, this is Formula One. It's meant to be. It's meant to be difficult. It's the pinnacle of motorsport um, anywhere in the world, and um, and therefore it's a good thing that it's difficult. I think the thing, you know, one of the, one of the key things that I've uh, noticed looking back over the two and a half, three years, is when we first entered. And um, Oliver mentioned the RRA, the agreement between the teams, is a good example. And one of the um, one of the things that was agreed between the teams and um, and the FIA was that there would be this legally binding um, uh, uh, framework um, to help um, restrict uh, the amount of resources that are employed. And that that one thing alone was so pivotal to us being able to bring our business uh, into Formula One. Without that, it would have been um, virtually impossible because. As, as things currently stand, um, and, and this is an area where we had hoped there'd been a lot more progress up to now, um, we still have a set of regulations where you can buy success, and that's not good in any sport. Thank you very much, gentlemen. If you want to find out more about Formula One, go to ft.com slash Formula One. That's it from this business of F1 video. Thank you.